Aloha and welcome to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center's An Afternoon with the Author. Uh, we are so excited to have all of you with us today. An Afternoon with the Author is where we invite authors from across the state and nation to come on and talk to us about the backstory behind their work. My name is Deidre Teagarden. I'm the director here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, where our mission is to inspire people to find the hero within themselves through the legacy of our Nisei veterans. And you can find out more information about our center on the web at nvmc.org. Uh, today, we welcome Violet Harada and Claire Sato, uh, the editors of the book, A Resilient Spirit, The Voice of Hawaii's Internees. Now, before I introduce our authors, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items as we wait for more people to join the call. Uh, number one, as always, we always welcome your questions. So please type your questions in that little question and answer box at the bottom left of your screen um, as you have them throughout the, throughout the presentation, and we'll get to as many as we can. This is being recorded and will be available on our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center YouTube channel in approximately a week. So we invite you to check out our YouTube channel and linger a little while to see what other talks we have up there that might be of interest to you. We also wanna thank our sponsors who make all of the work that we do here at the center possible. And uh, you saw those names at the beginning of the talk. Uh, personally, we also want to just give a few shout outs. Uh, I wanted to thank Brenda Saifuku Yaspi and her mother, Edna Saifuku, and her sister, Sandy Chang. Uh, they were the original uh, people who brought this book to our attention, and Sandy and her mother, Edna, actually purchased a copy for us, and, and Brenda bought, brought it in to us. So a very big mahalo to, to them. Um, that of course uh, is the Sam Nishimura family uh, who you'll be hearing a little bit about later as well. Also a big mahalo to Carol Hayashino, the former executive director of the JCCH, uh, Japanese Cultural Center uh, of Hawaii uh, for connecting us all and to Ken at the bookstore at the JCCH who uh, sent us over a couple boxes of books so that we have them available here at the center. So mahalo to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today, uh, starting with Claire Sato. Claire Sato is a retired school librarian. She received her bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's degree in library studies from UH Manoa. Claire taught at Lincoln, Palisades, and Nanakuli Elementary Schools. She served as a librarian at Nanakuli, Shafter, and Noilani Elementary Schools. As an instructor at UH Manoa's Library and Information Science Program, Claire mentored many beginning librarians. In 1998, the Hawaii Association of School Librarians presented their Golden Key Award to Claire for her outstanding contributions to the profession in Hawaii. And since 2004, Claire has volunteered her services at the Japanese Cultural Center. And in 2015, she was the recipient of the Spirit of JCCH Award that honors JCCH volunteers. Hello, Claire. Hello. We, uh, I also want to introduce Violet Harada. Violet Harada is a professor emeritus in the Library and Information Science Program at UH Manoa. She taught in Oahu Secondary Schools, worked as a librarian in Honolulu Elementary Schools, and served as a state-level specialist overseeing the work of school libraries statewide before joining the UH Manoa faculty. At UH, she coordinated the preparation program for school librarians. Violet has jointly authored and edited books and articles on the instructional role of school librarians and shared her research at various state, national and international conferences. In 2011, the American Association of School Librarians recognized Violet with their Distinguished Service Award for her outstanding national contributions to school librarianship. So ladies, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Welcome. So I want to uh, really just jump into 
to this book, but I want to start off by learning a little bit more about how you got involved with the story, because neither of you has a direct connection to the Hawaii internment story, nor to the World War II Nisei veterans story. Um, so Violet, you know, what got you involved? You know, I'd actually like to have Claire started off on this, if you don't mind. Go ahead, Claire. Claire what got you involved? Well, I've always felt that stories were, um, history was stories, and that we'd fully understand history through stories of the times. And so when I volunteered, as I volunteered at JCCH in the Resource Center, I started to hear the stories that were coming in that were being shared amongst us and then filed away. And, and I thought, it's such a shame. It's wonderful that we have the stories, but nobody else other than our group of people would hear the stories. And it would be really nice if somehow we could get the stories out so others could hear. And that's kind of how we started talking about maybe doing a book. And Claire being Claire, she started sharing those stories with me. And we're, we were traveling in Japan at one point and we're on this train and she's looking out the window and she's telling me, you know, there are so many stories at JCCH in the resource center, but not many people know about them. And that got me thinking because she started telling me about the Hawaii internment story. And I realized I knew absolutely nothing about it. And it saddened me and it angered me and I realized boy, history is really lopsided. We don't hear the voices. And so when she said story, something went ping in my mind. And I said, well, maybe we should do a book. And she said, yeah, let's do a book. So that's how it got started, Deidre. Oh, that's wonderful. And I, I love what you say, said Claire about they, there are these stories that are out there, but unless you know where to look, uh, you're not going to, to learn about them. Um, before we dive into the book a little bit deeper, um, Violet, I was wondering if you could give us a, a little bit of background on Honouli Uli, the internment camp in Honolulu. Uh, I don't know that everybody on the call uh, knows all that encompasses uh, that camp. Could you give us a little 101? A 101 on this. Um, first, apologies to any of our viewers who might have so much more information than I do on Honouli Uli, but I'll just share a little bit here. Um, it's the largest and the longest running of the internment camps in Hawaii. I think it was established in 1943 and then it closed up in 1946. And during that time, it was not just an internee camp, it was also a POW camp. So I Imagine through the documents that I've read that as many as 300 internees were kept there at any one time, but the larger contingent was actually the POW camp, two of them on side by side. And, and that camp had a, as many as three to 4,000 um, prisoners in there at any given time. Where was this actually located? Well, it was a little bit farther away from Pearl Harbor in the Eva Plains and deep in a gulch, very humid, lots of mosquitoes. So the internees there had a name for Honouli Uli, and it was Jigokudani, Hell Valley. For them, it was hell, actually. And um, gosh, once the war ended and they closed up the Honouli Uli, military records just kind of buried the whole thing. And the internees themselves just didn't want to talk about it very much. So very shortly, it sort of disappeared from view for many, many years. And, and, and finally, uh, in about 1997, KHNL was doing a special and they called into um, JCCH to ask, where exactly is this camp? And nobody really knew, but this set off an investigation it took five years, five years. In 2002, it, a search party actually found it, found the site itself there. And of course, JCCH has taken a major leadership role in making Honouli Uli known and was really a very important part of the crusade to get it declared a national monument. 
And finally, in 2015, uh, President Obama declared it a national monument. And now it's under the oversight of the National Park Service. So that's kind of a little bit of a 101 on it. Thank you. Thank you for that. So in leading up to this interview, we've been talking on and off. And the, the two things that were the, the thing that resonates the most for me from the two of you is the importance of sharing these stories, uh, the importance of sharing who these people were, their poems, uh, and everything that they went through. So I know that today we're going to be doing a lot of readings. And I'm uh, so happy about that because these stories need to, to be shared. But before we do that, I also know it was important for you to share some acknowledgements. So before we get too far along in the, in the talk, would you like to share your acknowledgements now? Yes, I would. And forgive me, I will read it because I don't want to forget or somehow skip anyone's name. It really was, this book was truly a team effort and we had such a wonderful team. First and foremost, we have to give a big thank you to Kara Hayashino was the president director emeritus of JCCH for her incredible support. She never, never support, never supported us. She got funding from Monsanto Hawaii and the Freeman Foundation to produce the book. We also have to extend a huge thank you to Jane Kuahara, who was our guru in getting through the, the documents. She inspired us to pursue doing the book. We also had a terrific team of fellow volunteers and community members who pitched in whenever we needed to find information, when we needed pictures, and when we needed to have translations done. Betsy Young, Gyo Kobayashi, John Okutani, Linda Harada, Kathy Kiabu, Tatsumi Hayashi, Noriko Asato, and Ernest Lau. Thank you so much. And the JCCH staff members who also helped us along the way. They secured resources did preparing documentation and rechecking sources for us. Marsha Campbell, Michelle Miyashiro, Audrey Kaneko, Denise Park, and Jenna Lau. We couldn't have done it without you. Finally, we created the story, but it was transformed into a visual work of art by our layout editor, Joy Oshiro. And also a big thank you to Mark Ibarra with Edwards Enterprises for printing the book and giving it its beautiful professional look. Most of all, we thank the internees and their families. There would not have been a book without their voices. It truly did take a village to produce this book. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Claire. And uh, it's, it's no small task to produce a book. And uh, a big congratulations to Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, JCCH, Carol Hayashino, and the, the whole team that you just mentioned. Uh, all right, so Claire, I know you prepared some readings for us today, and I'm going to try to do a little PowerPoint as you do the readings. We'll see how that works out, but uh, I was wondering if you could start at the beginning um, talking about uh, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and then the, you know, going right into the families being taken away from their homes. Would you do that for us? Sure. Chapter one, December 7th, 1941. On December 7th, 1941, bombs were dropped by the Imperial Army of Japan on Pearl Harbor and World War II began for America. Life for Japanese Americans would never be the same again. On Oahu, Haru Tanaka describes the confusion that morning. When I saw the planes that morning, I thought they were having training with make-believe enemy planes with red rising sun emblems painted on them. Then someone yelled out, Senso, Senso, war, war. I saw a plane fall nearby and burn two houses. Fire started in a third. One of the families had been asleep and ran out in night clothes. A woman had just come home back from buying bread when she saw her house burst into flames. There was a lot of guja guja confusion as people rushed to help. Chapter two, torn from their families. On the night of December 7th and the days following, individuals were ripped from their homes on islands throughout the territory without explanation or given cause. Fear and bewilderment permeated 
the Japanese American community. Otokichi Muen Ozaki wrote this poem in Hilo. I bid farewell to the faces of my sleeping children as I am taken prisoner into the cold night rain. On the heels of detainment came the dreaded interrogations. In one of his interrogations, Yoshitami Jack Tasaka was asked, who should win the war? Interrogation by the authorities started with various questions about my personal background, eventually ending with a question, do you think it's better for Japan to win this war? If I answered it was better for Japan to win, I would be sent to a detention center as an enemy alien. If I answered, I like America to win, they would insistently say, don't lie. I know you are really praying for Japan to win. Therefore, I had no choice but to offer a harmless and inoffensive answer. I do not like war. I really hope Japan and America will make peace as soon as possible. Then they asked me, if your older brother lands in Hawaii, can you shoot your brother? If I answered, I would not dare to shoot him, I would be branded as an enemy alien. If I answered, I would shoot him, they would say again, don't lie, he is your blood brother. No way would you shoot him. Furthermore, they asked, are you willing to work together with us? This meant if I was willing to make myself a cat's paw for the authority, if I said no, I would be sent to Ono Uli Uli. If I said yes, I would be allowed to go home and forced to work as their spy. I mean, these are such emotional uh, stories. How, how does one even begin to, to comment on them? And uh, what a responsibility it was to you both uh, to, to put these together. Um, I'd like to, to, to talk a little bit about the, the protocols and the procedures that you did follow uh, in order to publish these stories. You know, I'm sure you just didn't go into the JCCH archives and pick out stories. Can you, can you talk to us about that process and, and talking with the families and getting their okay um, on, on all of this? Violet, would that be a question for you? Yeah, that's a big story actually. Um, well, the first thing was the inspiration to do this. And thank you, a big thank you to Carol. She loved the idea, gave us the green light. So then Claire and I looked at each other, we were euphoric. And then the harsh reality set in, what do we do now? But we are librarians at heart. And so our first order was we have to collect these stories somehow. And this is where that team, that wonderful team, the volunteers, the other volunteers, our colleagues at JCCH, they all helped us. They would point out, this is a story you will want to read. This is a book you have to look at. Take a look at this letter. So we started to amass all of these pieces that we could look at. And then Claire and I spent some time actually going through these. And as we did that, what we had to do was figure out what excerpts we really wanted. So we had to photocopy pages, do these kinds of uh, highlighting. And we started to collect these in manila folders. And we had things like um, interrogation at uh, the immigration station or meals in the mess halls and so forth. About 18 months into doing this, we had amassed about, oh, I would say about 300, yeah, Claire, 300 excerpts. We knew we had too much because it was a modest little book we were looking at. So then became the job of editing. And this is where we had to put our editor's hats on and say, well, really, which ones do we want to use? We want those stories that tug at our hearts. We want those stories that tell a special incident that we want to capture. And you know, this is where working with someone like Claire is such a joy for me because Claire, you are so right brain, you know, you have that creative spirit, you have that that emotional core. So when Claire would say, you know, we got to keep that one. I cried when I read it. We knew we had to keep it, that sort of thing. And I'm more the left brain. I would say, well, we got to organize this stuff. We got too much here. We got to move some stuff off. We got to take some things out and we got to meet those deadlines. So together we worked and we got it together. 
Finally, when we had the pieces, about a hundred excerpts, we realized the other big part now had to happen, which is actually how are we gonna organize this into a book? And this is where um, we kind of visualize this like, a, I would say curating an exhibit in a gallery. We had to think, what's the first panel that we want people to hear and see? What's the second panel? What's the third panel? And uh, we finally came up with 11 chapters of, of these kinds of voices that we thought would form a flow of some kind. And then we realized now we have the text, we have to have the photos. So began the search for photos from within the RC collection, the Resource Center collection and beyond. In the meantime, while we were doing that, we're collecting copyright permission forms. We're also doing photo credits. We didn't so much talk to families, Deidre, as much as we were going through the primary resources that we had. We had to get permissions for some of those things though. So finally, when we had everything, we had to make sure we had it in digital format. So we had to get that together before we could hand it off to Joy, our layout editor, for her to do her magic on that. So the entire process was a kind of a long one, but um, every step of the way, the main thought we were having in our brain was, how do we tell this story in a way that's respectful, that shows the dignity of these individuals, that will make their families feel, I'm so glad that this book was written. So that kind of was the overlying philosophy that we went with. That's a big responsibility to to have on your have on your shoulders and and inside, um, yeah. did it ever, did it ever overwhelm you? Oh, well, we had our peaks and our valleys, right? There were times when Claire told me, I don't think I wanna do this anymore. Let's stop, you know, kind of thing. And then I would say, nah, I think we could wait. This, this is really great. And then there'd be times when I would say, I think I'm gonna stop. And Claire would say, I can pick it up. So just working in partnership was really wonderful. And yes, it weighs on you that you want to do a book that just, does some justice to this part of history. So it's, it's a responsibility, but it was one that I think we were really proud to be able to shoulder. Thank you. Um, Claire, let's move on to life inside uh, Hono Uli Uli. And I was wondering if you could do some of the readings of uh, sure. chapters four, five, and six. Yeah. Okay, chapter four. Daily life behind barbed wire. Rise, roll call, meals, lights out. Rise, roll call, meals, lights out. Rise, roll call, meals, lights out. Life was a repetitive and dreary cycle. Internees learned to appreciate small diversions and survive with scant resources in their daily life behind the barbed wire. Dan Toto Nishikawa talks about the monotony. You know can read the magazine, you know can read the paper, you know can write the letter. Just eat and sleep, eat and sleep. Nothing to do, gotta do something, otherwise going to be crazy, you know, if you think about the family. In the midst of the turmoil in their lives, there emerged individuals who performed acts of kindness and thoughtfulness that made imprisonment more bearable for their comrades. Matsujiro Otani describes how one person took care of the elderly and sick. The biggest problem was the washing place. We had been relocated with only the clothes on our backs. The only thing we could wash was our top and bottom underwear but people who were ill like myself could not even do this. Fortunately, I had a friend, Mr. Muneki Obata of the Nipujiji, Nipujiji newspaper who washed our clothes for myself and other elderly and sick people. Every day after lunch, he would even help us bathe. He took care of us until he was sent to the mainland with the first group to be sent there. We were truly grateful for all the help that he gave us. Chapter five, pastimes. To keep themselves occupied and sane, the internees engaged in woodwork, music, and games that became a crucial part of their lives along with intellectual pursuits such as learning English. Yoshitami Jack Tasaka describes how internees ingeniously created a musical instrument 
There were many music lovers among the internees and quite a few of them were blessed with superior talents as singers and players or players. Music really consoled me and my fellows during those prosaic days. However, it was Tama Nikizu, a flaw in the gem, because it was very difficult to obtain the necessary musical instruments. One day we heard a strange musical sound from the next barrack. They told us it was a handmade guitar made from an empty can of boiled ham. Armor brand boiled ham, which was shaped like a giant, like a large rice ball, was taken out of the can and they devised a way to use the empty can, attaching a rod and stringing wires on it. The resulting instrument was a kind of hybrid of an ukulele, a guitar, and a ryukyu jamise, Okinawan three-stringed instrument, making a strange tone that made the listeners feel melancholy. Mr. Kotaro Hirayoshi, who could be called a musical genius, had an insatiable appetite for the ham can guitar and enjoyed strumming it from morning till evening. Chapter six, mess hall meals. The earlier meals in camp were Western style military food. The internees endured high fat canned or cure, cured meats, canned vegetables and fruits, bread, beans. There was no rice, shoyu, miso, fresh vegetables or fruits, and certainly no fresh fish, foods that they were accustomed to in their other life. Otokichi Muen Ozaki tells of the longing for familiar foods in this poem. My elderly roommate wonders aloud, will that day come when I may have a bowl of tasty miso soup? So we were talking the other day about the, the values, the, the Nisei values, and Claire, you said that the, the value that really stuck out to you as you were editing the book and, and reading these poems was that of compassion. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that in, in the context of the internment camp. Well, it was compassion that they, they, they cared enough about each other and they took care of each other. They made their horrible life somehow livable because they took care of each other and they um, saw to it to make their lives up. Each person took it upon themselves because they were such compassionate people to make the other's lives better. And that, that just shouted out to me as we read the stories um, of this experience. Can I, can I just jump in with something too, Deidre, on this? Um, Claire's right, that compassion that they showed for one another is what helped them survive this, this enormously difficult time. Um, but in the book, we also have some excerpts, right, Claire, that deal with the um, officers who were also compassionate. There was a, I'm not gonna read it, but there was a, such a, a Sergeant Loveless who showed so much humanity toward the, um, the internees. They talked about him, they really loved him. So, you know, you hear those kinds of stories and it, it warms your heart because it was such a difficult time for all of them. So just wanted to mention it was, yeah, among themselves, but also there were others in the camps that also showed that kindness. You know, and then that ability after they were out of the camps to, you know, to continue on with their lives, I mean, their that the compassion and ability to, I don't know if it's forgive, um, but you know, you can you talk a little bit about that. I mean, um, from what you read, was there that ability afterwards to to forgive? I just wonder if. By the fact that they showed the compassion that in a sense they were already forgiving while experiencing this whole this whole thing. Um, I don't know if I <laughs> you want to add anything. 
I don't know that we have an excerpt yeah. in the book on this, but obviously that ability to, um, to forgive and move on is part of the success story of the American Japanese, mm -hmm. uh, not only in Hawaii, but across the nation. I think difficult as it is, and I keep using the term difficult, but difficult as it was, it also strengthened their resolve, I think, to be better people and to move ahead in that way. And, and we see many, many uh, instances of this beyond the book, but nonetheless, I really think that moral fiber there, that, that, that courage there uh, was an important part of what happened after the war. Just by the, the, our book title, Resilience, their resilient spirit is what carried them through. Right. Um, what type of feedback have you gotten from the book? Larry, do you want to say anything on it? Or you want me to start? You start. <laughs> <laughs> well, the kind of feedback that I've been getting is, is very interesting because I, I, I've met some people that I never knew before that tell me, you know, I read that book and you have my grand uncle in the book or you have my grandfather in the book. And um, the connections they're making with their own families is profound and it's extremely moving. But then I have the other thing, cause I'm a, I've been a teacher all of my life and I've taught some graduate courses where we have had to discuss the American Japanese, the Japanese American experience. And I have graduate students who come up to me and say things like, I had no idea, no idea whatsoever that we had any kind of internment camp here in Hawaii, that anything like this was happening. So this was, this was that lopsided history I was talking about, that suddenly they saw a part of history that they, they'd never seen before. It was hidden, it was something ignored, and now suddenly they got to see it. So those are some things that were big ahas for me. It made me feel so grateful that these stories are there and that we were able to start to tell some of them. Claire, anything you want to say? I just got told, good book. Can't go wrong with that. I can't go wrong. Um, before we go on to the next reading, I want to interject some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, uh, someone's asking, were women also interned in Honouli Uli? There were a few, but very few. And the point of this is, uh, and there might be people in the audience who would know this better. So this might be a question some of them will want to answer in their chat also. Um, but largely, you know, the population that was taken in Hawaii were, for the vast, vast majority, were actually men. And so we don't have many stories of women in those camps. And uh, someone's asking, where would people have been taken to be questioned immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Would that have been, um, would that have been Sand Island? Where would that have been? Uh, many of them were taken to the immigration station. And, I, and that was probably for many of them the first, uh, well, those on the neighbor islands were taken to some of the very small and um, not very uh, permanent uh, detainment centers there because on each of the major islands we've discovered some of these right I think there's something like 17 of them that have been discovered so far on every island including of course Maui um, but they were taken from there and, and many of them may have, were taken to immigration station they were interrogated there and um, then where they went from there depended Sand Island because Sand Island was the first place that they could be kept Honouli Uli was not actually built till 1943. So some of them got to Honouli Uli after that, but many of them got sent to the mainland camps. I don't know whether that answered the question that she asked or he asked, but. I think, I think that did. And okay. then um, the countries from which the POWs were uh, at Honouli Uli, which countries um, housed? 
I don't know the countries. Again, maybe some of the um, chat people might know this better, so you might want to keep checking the chat on this. But um, these these were not uh, soldiers for the most part. These were the workforce that the Japanese had put into the um, uh, into service for themselves. So many of them were from the Pacific areas, largely. Whether they were from other parts of the the world, I'm not that certain. So that can, might be something. Yeah. And we can look that up and uh, send that answer, send that yeah. answer out. But um, Claire, do you, can you do a few more, a few more readings for us? Um, you know, it's, it's such an emotional book. And when you get to chapters uh, seven, eight, and 10, those are equally um, hard to read, but uh, would you, would you share that with us? Sure. Chapter seven, separation and longing. Ripped from their homes and the peaceful lives they had known, incarcerated without cause, thrown into places of internment like animals, these internees yearned for their families and any whispers from the outside world. Ryuzo Hidai shares this loneliness. Mr. Tetsu Oi placed a photo of his wife next to his bed and prayed every day. Dear, are you all right? You and the children, take care of your health. When an apple or orange was distributed at the mess hall, he would offer the item before his wife's photo before consuming it. Later, I asked my wife to send me a photo of her and my daughter. I placed the photo on the shelf and prayed every day and night that they be well in the days to come. Yasutaro Keiho Soga captured his sadness after a visit from his wife in this poem. A lingering touch after a long half year, I take my wife's hand into mine, and for at least a half day, I do not wash away her touch. Chapter eight, Sorrow in the Camps. The harsh and bitter reality of prison life was more than some individuals could handle. Extreme depression and stress made them victims to heartbreaking behaviors. Sam Nishimura wrote this. I noticed that one guy had a four inch diameter square rock. Every day he kept rolling it and finally it became a perfect baseball. He was just doing that every day until it became a round ball. When asked, what are you going to do with that? He said he was going to give it to my sweetheart. Just going at it every day, nothing else. Nobody talked with him. Chapter 10, Bittersweet Reflections. The unjust upheaval of their lives left internees and their families with inevitable feelings of sorrow, indignation, rage, and humiliation. They suffered deep psychological stock scars that could never be erased. Harry Urata described one father's unbearable loss. One day I found an Issei at a room, uh, a corner of a room. He was in the same barrack with, with mine. He was crying while reading a letter. When I asked him why he was crying, he said he was crying because the military authorities informed him that his son was killed in action in Italy. At that moment, I had a peculiar feeling. I felt sympathy for him. And at the same time, I was indignant at the government. So we had talked a little bit earlier about putting the book together and, you know, did it get overwhelming at times, but personally, how did you take on these stories and take them home with you at night and go to work with them the next day? How did they affect you both? Violet, do you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that happened to me in, in getting involved with this project was I started to realize I had biases that I never even knew I had. And one of those was how I viewed 
the issei Japanese male. I guess I didn't realize how I was thinking about them, but I had to own up to it because I thought of them as stoic. I thought of them as not unfeeling, but having difficulty expressing their feelings to their families. Um, people who were a lot of, seemed dispassionate. But then, then I started reading those memoirs. I read those letters that they wrote home and I wrote, I read those poems. And suddenly I started to see sides of them I had never seen before, you know, they were, they feared for their lives. They, they were just beyond lonely and they, um, they loved their families. They were real human beings and that's what I saw. Claire, what about you? Do you have any, any, you, know, you want to me, share? For me, it was like taking my friends home when I took stories home to read, my, my chichang and, or bachang. Um, and I knew I wanted these stories told. And so I carried my friends, chichang and bachang, home with me to read through and, um, in that sense, I don't know. I got new fr new friends and new more. I, I never knew my grandparent, my grandfathers, and so this these jichangs were really um, something to have with me. Is it different reading these stories and poems out loud than it is reading them in print to yourself? Well, this experience has caused me to read the stories out loud and it's just been really, it's been really helpful to me. I have come to appreciate the book more than I have in the past. I, I now will say it's a good book. There are, the stories are worth reading and reading it aloud, um, I don't know, it brings it home to me more. Um, the poetry, I, I, like, I like poetry because to me, poetry says in a very, in few words, what the story is, what the emotions were, what the feelings were. It gets to the heart of the story in a few words. Um, in the book, we use the word story, and this may be going off your question, but we use the word story to describe what we have put in there. And you know, as a librarian, we think story is a fictional account, but this is not a fictional account. These are, um, we're relating the accounts as told by internees, but to say relating the accounts as told by internees is cold somehow. But if we say story, the word story has heart to them and the stories that we have in here um, relays the feelings to me of the experiences of the internees. What are you, what do you ladies want to have come from the book? What do you want the book's legacy to be? Claire, you wanna start or you want me to start? Go ahead, start. <laughs> you can start. You know, um, because I knew so little about this life, well, I have to admit, I knew nothing about it for a very long time. I guess one big dream of mine in doing a modest book like this is the hope that this will also open up the eyes of others like myself who didn't know this piece of history. I think it's so important. And, you know, as I worked on this book, it, it made me realize again that, you know, history, history is a kind of a, um, a dynamic continuum. I hate to get professorial here, but you know, it, it really is because it's, it's taking the past, but being able to connect it to the present in order that we can take that past and present 
and help to shape our future. And doing this book just made me realize that this is a piece of history that we need if we want to understand the present and make some changes that will make a better future. So Claire and I are teachers at heart, right? We started off in the classrooms. And so I know one of our big dreams always is if we're going to do a book, we want the book to be something that young readers can also pick up and learn from. And I know we both dream that what we really want to see is that we start to build, build those young citizens who, who not only are critical thinkers, but they also have those compassionate hearts. And we think that you know a, a book like this is a very small attempt to move in that direction. I see Claire nodding, but you have something to say, right? Well, you can see why Vi and I work so well together. Um, for me, history is stories, right? And for her, it's a continuum. And both are true, of course. I guess mostly what I would like is for people to read um, today and understand and feel for what a group of people, innocent people, what they went through. And hopefully from that learn so that that kind of experience doesn't happen again. But in today's world, it's a hope. That's it. Um, before we go on to another reading, and thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being um, so personal and open today on this talk and also you know, in our conversations prior. Uh, that's very much appreciated and uh, thank you for that. But before we go on to another reading, um, let's see, someone asked, do you know if um, anyone from Japan has read the book and have there, have there been any uh, reactions? I, I would guess that um, Carol and the JCCH team definitely shared copies with, you know, Council General and other people, but uh, do you have any, any, do you know about any uh, reaction from Japanese readers? Um, not a whole bunch. It just so happens that uh, one of my former students is now a professor herself in Japan, in Tokyo, and um, she read the book. And she told me she too didn't know this part of the history and that she was sharing it with her students in her literature class. So that was the only word that I got from Japan, but it was touching to me to know that it made a connection for her yeah. and that she's using it. And, you know, one thing we say here at the center is you don't have to be Japanese American. You don't have to have a direct connection to World War II to understand that these, you know, and have compassion for these stories. And I, I think this book is uh, certainly, certainly speaks, speaks to that. Um, uh, Claire, would you like to read the, the, final, the final chapter? Sure. Chapter 11, A Resilient Spirit. Their unshakable spirit of human resilience proved to be the internee's backbone that carried them through their internment experience and sustained them through the rest of their lives. Otokichi Muen Ozaki describes an uplifting experience. Out in the yard, trenches had been dug and mounds of fresh dirt piled up. In the empty lot outside the fence, one side had been cleared and plowed and beans, potatoes, and other vegetables planted, possibly because of a food supply problem. I began watching the bean plants grow while having my meals outdoor, outdoors. Soon I was concentrating more on the plants than on my dirty eating utensils. My friend, Mr. K, once asked, what's so interesting out there? I replied, look at that bean plant. It's grown a few inches since the day we were thrown into this place. It has the determination to survive. The least we can do is to keep ourselves in good health and survive like the bean plant. From then on, the bean plant became a great comfort to Mr. K and me. At times when I sank into despair and became edgy, 
The plants climbing vines brightened my spirits and raised my hopes. And he wrote, even the bean vine is glad to be alive, stretching its tendrils up into the morning air. That's beautiful. And it does speak to that resilient spirit and so many of our, our Nisei soldiers and their families um, came back with that idea of resilience and continuing service. And what a beautiful piece to end the book on. Um, did either, I mean, I know you are both educators, you are both librarians uh, and you have edited this book but have either of you dabbled in your own writing or poetry, whether it was inspired by what you were doing or, or otherwise? You mean on a professional level? I mean, personally, of course, we keep journals and I write poetry and things of that nature and I'll write stories, but nothing for publication. It's all personal and private. Nice. What about you, Violet? Um, I dabbled a little in short stories, got one published a long time ago, but haven't done much in that area. Most of my writing, unfortunately, it would be boring for you. It's largely um, dealing with school librarianship and issues involved and teaching involved, that sort of thing. Um, we couldn't do it without our librarians. I know we have uh, some wonderful librarians who um, have helped us here at the center and Ramona Ho, I don't know if she's on our call today. She was a retired librarian from Kamehameha Schools, but it's such a special uh, skill and love that you have. It's, uh, we appreciate it greatly. I know uh, Ramona, she's wonderful. I'm so <laughs> glad you have her as a volunteer. Say hello for me. She certainly will. And uh, she's, still, she's still helping, so we, we, we love it. Um, I'm going to see if we have, we have a few more questions here. Um, is there public access to the names of the internees? Um, I'm not sure if they're asking about that in the book specifically, um, but there, you know, we can get that information to you, Jill, uh, separately. But do you have any information on uh, an internee website or that you know of? Well, JCCH has an attorney database website that's going on that uh, I, I can't really speak to it because I'm not working on it directly, but it is there. And certainly they can go to the JCCH site and find out more about it. Uh, I don't understand the question about public access in the book. By the way, the book as it finally came out is about a hundred pages long. We finally whittled it down to about a hundred plus excerpts and about maybe 60 photos and facsimiles of documents, but also we have an appendix at the end that is a, a compilation of very short profile statements of each of the internees that are part of the book. So that's also part of the book there. I'm not sure it answers the question that this uh, person had, but that's some of the access points. There are also, you know, in the uh, Resource Center collection, oral histories, and um, efforts are being made to digitize the photos and things. So it's a slow process. It's an expensive process. It requires a lot of help going forward. But if people are interested in hearing or learning more about it, they should really contact the Japanese Cultural Center and the librarian who is Mary Campany. She's a wonderful person uh, in the Resource Center to get more information on that. Thank you. And I think uh, Jill is the person who wrote this question in and she's looking for a specific person. So probably if she reached out, um, there would be some help there. I can't believe that we have come to the end of an hour. Um, I want to thank you both for being here. I'm going to come back to you for some closing remarks, but for everybody else, I want to say thank you for being with us today. Our speaker next month for the March afternoon with the author is going to be Tom Kaufman. He's going to be talking about his book, How Hawaii Changed America. And that will be on the 20th at 1.30. Uh, later this coming week, we have a special talk called the Nisei Narrative with Mr. Tak Nakayama. 
He is from uh, California. He was uh, spent his some childhood days in the Aurora, Arkansas uh, detention internment camp. Later on, turned out to be, came up to be a journalist and covered the Civil Liberties um, Act of 1988. So we're going to be talking to him about his experiences, uh, both uh, as a young child and later as a journalist uh, covering what he did. And that, that'll be on the 18th of this month at 3 p.m. And then on the 25th of this month at 4 p.m., we're launching our new series, East Meets West, where we invite someone from America and someone from Japan to come on and have a dialogue. And we're very excited to have Dr. Maya Satoro uh, from Hawaii and Dr. Mariko Gakia from Japan, uh, right currently with Osaka University, um, with us to have a dialogue about differences between culture and how even though we have those differences, we are all very similar. So all of these events are listed on our website at nvmc.org and you can go there to sign up. So we certainly hope you do. Uh, ladies, I, I turn it back over to you for some closing remarks. Claire, you wanna start off? Working with Deidre has been such a good experience. Um, it gave me, as I said earlier, uh, a greater awareness and appreciation for the book. Um, I thank you very much, Deidre, for giving us, for giving me this experience. I've learned a lot from it. I, I was fighting and screaming about doing it because I didn't feel I could, but because of your patience, thank you very much. We did it. Thank you. Oh, I love you, Claire. That's so perfect. Um, you know, so much of history is just a retelling of facts and facts from only one perspective. And I think doing this book made me fully appreciate once again, how important it is to have more than one voice up there, more than one story up there. And also the fact that rather than bland historical facts, really what people feel would be hearing the voices, seeing, putting a face onto history. And, and this is, I think, so important if we're going to start to talk about, do we have a democracy? What does a democracy look like? How do we build a better democracy together? It has to start with stories that we can relate to. And I second everything that Claire just said. Deidre, you and your center are perpetuating the legacy and living the legacy on, much as JCCH is doing the same thing. It's organizations like yours and JCCH that really are telling the story and keeping it alive and making things better for all of us. So big mahalo. Well, thank you very much. We're humbled and honored to be a, a part of this, this bigger story. Thank you again, Claire Sato, Violet Harada for your work and for being with us today. We are forever grateful. Until we meet again, everybody, have a wonderful weekend. Um, ahui ho, be well and stay safe. Aloha. <laughs>